Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Elhamdülillah ve salatu ve selamu ala nabiyyina Muhammed. Ve şerhu la ilahe illallah vahduhu la şerike lah. Ve şerhu anna Muhammedin abduhu ve rasuluhu. Abba ba'd. Elhamdülillah. Today we come to our final lecture in, in the series on Al-Hasid. Uh, the seventh uh, lecture inshallah. And as I alluded to last time, I wanted to end the lectures on a kind of a positive note. We have so far discussed many, what we could say, negative, uh, possible negative influences on our, on our lives. The definition we, de we defined Hasid, for example, we gave some of the various manifestations and the different levels of a Hasid and some of the evils that can result from Hasid. And we also discussed some of the means, some of the steps, inshallah, that will help us remove the hasid from our hearts. So today, inshallah, we want to discuss some positive aspects that are still, uh, some of them are related to, we can say, the concept of a hasid. And others are basically the opposite or the antithesis of hasid. Now, if we had time to discuss this in detail, we would be discussing the, the following four concepts. The first is the good hasid, the good hasid, or even the obligatory hasid. The second is the concept of al-ithar, al-ithar, or sacrificing for the sake of one's brother or sister. The third is the concept of a tenafus or the positive and beneficial type of brotherly competition and the final concept or the final aspect that we would discuss is the aspects of brotherhood al and al-wala the kind of relationship that Muslims are supposed to have towards one another as I said all of these we can say, either in a positive or a negative way, all these are related to al-hasid. And the vastness of these positive topics in relation to al-hasid shows us actually the greatness of the disease of al-hasid. Because al-hasid is, in many ways, the opposite of many of these positive aspects. So because al-hasid because can be so vast and can, so, can be so damaging and destructive to a believer's heart and to a believer's actions and to society as a whole. The opposite of al-hasid actually or the antithesis in many ways covers also, has to cover all of these different aspects that al-hasid could damage. So that is why if we wanted to discuss all the positive, we can, so, we can call them all the positive antidotes to al-hasid, this would be a, a much longer uh, lecture series than it is uh, already, so we'll have to be brief, inshallah. So I'll begin, inshallah, with the good and the obligatory hasid. A lot of the, for example, the non-Muslim writers, the contemporary writers, when they write about the hasid and the psychology of, of envy, I should say, the psychology of envy and so forth, they stress the fact that among the different sins or the different evils that one can possess, the hasid or envy, as they call it, has no good side to it. It is all evil. As opposed to some other things, like for example, we'll talk about anger, and I think we've already referred to anger. Anger has a positive side to it. There are times in which a rational and just and righteous person will get angry. So anger, anger has a positive side to it, as well as a negative side to it. But they argue that envy does not have such a positive side to it. It's all evil through and through. Actually, even in the West, if we go back to the times of the Greeks, the Greeks did distinguish between two aspects, two concepts. Although, many times they used just one word for it, the word zealous, Z-E-L-O-S in Greek. It can mean the kind of envy and jealousy that we've been talking about all along. However, they considered it as having a positive attribute as well. So some of them used to use this term zealous to express a desire to imitate or emulate. A desire to imitate or emulate. For example, Aristotle in his, in his second book of rhetoric, he says that uh, zealous 
this word zealous or this concept of zealous is a virtue that can motivate a man to improve himself by emulating a superior. It is a virtue in that it motivates a person to improve himself by emulating a superior. And in fact, even in the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the definitions that it gives is a definition that has no malice or no bad side to it, we can say. And, it's, and it is the, the, the desire to equal another in achievement or excellence and emulation. Now, commenting on what Aristotle said in, in, in his work on rhetoric, uh, someone said that, kind of put a, a word of caution here, and said that when Aristotle, he writes of emulation as good envy, or envy ending in admiration, and thus this is something positive, this author notes that in general, in general, envy doesn't work this way. So therefore he said that, he's, he's saying that you know, he does not negate anything positive about envy, but he says that little is good about envy, except shaking it off, which, uh, he, he further says, as any of us who have felt it deeply knows, is not so easily done. Well, yes, if you don't have Iman, if you don't have the benefit of turning to the Qur'an and Sunnah for guidance and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help, yes, he's right. And this may be something very difficult to remove. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in Islam, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tools, has given us the help, has given us the ultimate supporter himself that can help us, inshallah, to remove this disease from our hearts. And in addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the guidance of the Qur'an and Sunnah, has defined and has shown for us where what can be called hasid, what can actually be called hasid, is beneficial. And we'll talk about this shortly, that many things in the heart, there are many concepts and emotions in the heart, feelings in the heart, that can be actually beneficial, even if even if for most human beings they are actually not that beneficial. And most of you probably are, are already very familiar and anticipating the hadith that I'm referring to where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا حسد إلا في إثنتين رجل أتاه الله مالا فصلت على هلكته في الحق وآخر أتاه الله حكمة فهو يقضي بها ويعلمها the Prophet ﷺ said there is to be no hasid except with respect to two. A person to whom Allah has given wealth and he uses it up for the purposes of truth. And another man whom Allah has given wisdom and judges by it and teaches it. So here the Prophet ﷺ has said that there is to be no hasid except in the case of two people, with respect to two people, you can have hasad. So the Prophet ﷺ here is allowing hasad. Obviously the Prophet ﷺ would not allow hasad unless there was something positive, unless this particular kind of hasad, that what he's referring to, is actually something positive. Now, actually when, when uh, many of our ulama, when they commented on this hadith, they kind of uh, went away from the literal statement of the Prophet Sallallahu and gave a definition or uh, gave an explanation of this hadith where you where you kind of remove any aspect at all of the root of what hasid is all about. So for example, uh, Ibn, ha Ibn Hajr says that here what is meant by al-hasid the word al-hasid is being used in a figurative sense. And the word al-hasid actually it means al-ghutta. Al-ghutta, and also Ibn Rajab, by the way, made, made the same comment. Al-ghutta is where one wishes for what another has, but does not wish that that blessing be removed from the other person. Okay, you wish you had it, but you do not wish that the blessing is removed from the other person. Okay, so here they're saying that what, when the Prophet ﷺ said al-hasid here, what he means is, uh, this other concept, which is very close, obviously, al-ghutta. But, inshallah, when we comment a little bit further, I, I think my conclusion, based on what other writers uh, have said, is that maybe there's a little bit more to it than that. And in fact, one other comment or one other explanation that Ibn Hajr has given, 
is that this is a, an example of what is known as istithna muqata where you or for example when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he ordered the angels to bow down and they all bow down illa iblis except iblis okay so this does not mean that iblis was one of the angels but this is what you can call an exception uh, I can't remember right now but there's a technical term for it in English but it is like a disjointed exception where it doesn't mean they all bow down except Iblis but what it means is they all bow down but Iblis did not okay, so it, it is not implying that Iblis was actually one of the of the angels and this is something common you can find it in, in the Arabic language and you can also find it even uh, in English there's, I've seen some examples of it but now when you when you define it in this way or when you interpret this hadith of the Prophet in this way now you're saying that this is not hasid at all this is something else so the Prophet is saying there's no hasid however you can look towards these people uh, so to speak and, and maybe have some kind of uh, feeling towards <laughs> what they have so when you when you identify it or when you define it in this way I think you lose a lot of the original meaning uh, Ibn Taymiyyah on the other hand uh, he stated that hasid is hatred and dislike for the state that the envy person is in okay, so you do not like that they receive something or that they have something and he said that there are two types he said that one type is that you dislike that the, the other person has received a bounty and we spoke about that and that is blameworthy type and he said the second is where the person dislikes that the other person has more desiring to be equal or better than him and he says that this is called al ghibta and this is what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to when he said al-hasid in this hadith uh, this interpretation by Ibn Taymiyyah has something, Allah alam, if you ask me, has something very strange in it because he is still saying that there is a dislike for what the other person has and this does not seem to be correct. In fact, Ibn Hajar and Ibn Rajab, when they said that here it means al ghibta they did not say that this implies some kind of dislike for what the other person has. You simply want to have the same that the other person has. Now, uh, some authors from the early, from one of the earlier scholars, al muhasabi and some of the contemporary uh, writers also, they said that here al-hasid does not have to be taken as something figurative but instead what it means as we spoke about when talking about the Greek concept it means more of a, of a feeling of wanting to be like them to emulate them and admiring them for what they have and this is a, a an aspect of hasid okay, when you think of hasid it's not just hatred for what the other person has but there's also a feeling that you want what the other person has now sometimes the, the malice and the resent can get so much can, can get to a point that even you don't care if you get that bounty you just want that bounty destroyed this is a as we said this is kind of a greater level of hasid but hasid at its, at its root starts from the point that someone has something that you would like to have you wish you would have it you think you deserve it more than the other person so there is this feeling of emulation and desire to have something and admiration that the Greeks spoke about and this feeling of kind of competition to be having what they're having and doing what they're doing and, and actually in, in Nisan al-Arab there is one of the de definitions of al-Hasid that uh, he mentions that comes very close to this so Ibn al-Qayyim also in a passage in al-Fawaid he says, for example, that all sorts of character and qualities, and this is what I alluded to earlier, they have certain limits to them. And if those limits are exceeded, the person is doing something wrong. So when those limits are exceeded, you are, they are exceeded either by going beyond the uh, furthest limit or not even reaching the minimum. Right? In, any, in either case, you are committing a, an error take the case of, of anger or hatred if someone gets angry or hates something not based on the Sharia he is going beyond the, the maximum limit of what is allowed for anger and hatred in the Sharia however at the same time if he feels no anger and no hatred towards 
the violation of Allah's laws and disrespect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if he has not even reached that minimum, then in reality he is also blameworthy. Okay, so these qualities, even these qualities that when you think of many times you can think of them as negative qualities, actually in general there is a sphere which is permissible that is proper and then there's two extremes on both ends. One you're going beyond the limits and the other one you haven't even come up to the minimum. And if you are in either of those two states, obviously you are doing something that is wrong. And if you are in either of those two states, it shows a kind of disease or something wrong in your heart. So if you do not even get angry over the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being violated, the Muslims being violated and so forth, if this doesn't even affect your heart, then this is a sign that there is some, some deadness, some death in your heart, some hardness in your heart. And this is actually, you are not coming up to the minimum required of you of this quality. And this is actually a requirement upon you. You have to love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is part of, at least of the complete components of Iman. If you want to be a complete believer, this is obligatory upon you. So if you are not fulfilling that, you are actually falling, sh falling short in one of the obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could take obviously many examples of that nature, but I think that uh, I think the point has been made. So now let's take this concept and apply it to a husband. Apply it to the idea of looking towards others and seeing what they have and having a feeling that you would like to be like them or have what they have. So if you see others, for example, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them as in this hadith of the Prophet has blessed them with knowledge or has blessed them with health, wealth and they are using those things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in other words, they are earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if you can see that and have no feeling in your heart that that's what you would like to be like, that you admire them and wish you could be like them and would like to do those things that they are doing. If you do not have that feeling in your heart at all, and this is a kind of hasid, we can call it hasid, the Prophet ﷺ has called it hasid. So we can refer to it as hasid. And this is, as some scholars spoke about it, this is the obligatory hasid on the heart. Because at the very least you should want to be like those people who are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you can see these people, regardless of how much actually wealth and how much uh, knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, but they are acting upon it and they are using it properly. And you look at yourself, for example, and you see that you are not doing it. Or you are not doing it like them. Or even if you are doing it to some extent. But you do not feel in your heart that you would like to be like them and actually do those things which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This means that there is some problem in your heart. You are not reaching the, the minimum level of feeling and even of this feeling of what we can call hasad that should be in your heart. So if you can see people obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't even care that you that you are similar to them at all and you can see them and it doesn't even matter to you whether you are like them or not or, or you have no feeling that you wish you could be doing the same things that they, that they are doing, this is definitely a sign that there is a problem in your heart. This is definitely a sign that there is a problem in your heart. Because you do not even have enough iman to stir your heart with the feeling that you wish you could be like them. You wish you could be doing the acts of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are doing. This is very this is not a matter to be taken lightly. This means you are not you are missing some minimum emotions in your heart. Now if you go, if you take this feeling and go too far and apply it to things where it doesn't belong, like the things of this dunya and so forth, that is the evil hasid that we've been talking about in the past few lectures. You definitely want to avoid that because that is a disease. 
but at the same time you have to have a minimum right I mean think of it like blood pressure <laughs> if you have if the blood pressure is too high everyone knows that this is a sign that something might happen to right but if you have zero blood pressure what does that mean you don't want to be on that uh, on that level either you want to find the proper medium approach within the limits the proper limits of the Sharia and you know earlier we spoke about the fact that hasid usually is, is occurs among those people who are close to one another people who can relate to one another and compare themselves to each other so especially if this is the case if you are looking at people who are similar to you and you see that they are acting properly with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time you are not well this should strike an emotion in your heart you should feel like why am I not doing what they're doing why can't I be like them I should try to change myself and take them as, as an example and try to be like them so in addition when you're looking at those people who are similar to you and close to you and you can see that they are doing acts beyond what you're doing and they're doing acts to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this should stir this emotion, we can call it again hasid, this emotion of hasid in your heart. But this is a positive emotion. This is a positive emotion of hasid. This means that the heart is not dead. This means that the heart has not lost all feelings. Because when the heart has lost all feelings, like the physical body when it is dead, this is <laughs> obviously not a good sign. I don't think I need to <laughs> say more than that. So this is what we can call the obligatory hasid. The obligatory hasid. Some scholars call it the obligatory hasid. Because when you think about it, you're talking about emulating and wishing to be like those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed to do what is good and to do the acts that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now some authors, in particular al-Muhasabi, he goes further and he says then there's also recommended hasid and there's also permissible hasid. Permissible hasid is with respect to people who are doing permissible things and so forth. Now, see now once you, once you do something like this, now you've gone beyond the limits of what have been stated in the Sharia. And you have to be careful about that. Now you can go back to the statement I quoted earlier that in general there's no good in, 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 in hasid and envy. That's true. In general, there is no good in, in envy, but there are some exceptions. And alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ has shown us what are the exceptions. And so therefore, we have to be careful also to restrict ourselves to what the Prophet ﷺ has said. And do not go from this and say, okay, now we can break down and say, oh, there's all sorts of uh, hasad which is okay and even permissible. That is dangerous. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, said, لا حسد. حسد, he's de denying any kind of Hasid, there should be no hasid at all, except in these two particular cases. So the Prophet ﷺ has restricted for us and made and has helped us identify where what is the limit that there is or there can be such a thing as hasid. And it is interesting to look in this hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ, and to see what the Prophet ﷺ has identified as the places wherein you can make hasid, what is hasid with respect to. And the Prophet ﷺ, again in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا حسد إلا في اثنتين رجل أتاه الله مالا فصلت على هلكته في الحق وَآخَرُوا أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ حِكْمَةً فَهُوَ يَقْضِي بِهَا وَيُعَلِّمُهَا There is to be no hasid except with respect to two a person to whom Allah has given wealth and he uses it up for the purposes of truth and another man whom Allah has given wisdom and judges by it and teaches it Now note what the Prophet is saying here The Prophet is, saying, is not saying that there should be hasid because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given somebody a certain bounty. The Prophet ﷺ did not say that have hasid for this person because Allah has given him wealth. Have hasid for this person because Allah has given him knowledge. Because having hasid for, for these kind of things 
this would be problematic because these things actually how much wealth that someone has and even the level of knowledge that someone is finally able to obtain has laws to do with things that are outside of our control where we were born and what family we were born how we were raised and so forth so to have hasid for these things that are outside of a human being's control this would be very self-destructive and, and self-defeating so you don't have hasid with respect to that but you have hasid with respect to the fact that Allah has given someone for example wealth and he uses it properly so the hasid is with respect to what he is doing with that wealth because we know another hadith for example the Prophet is describing uh, someone who does not, Allah has not given him wealth, Allah has not given him knowledge, and he says that if I had wealth, I would spend that wealth like the person who is spending it in haram. I wish I could be like that person. <laughs> so this, obviously, is not going to be beneficial for the human being. So it's not a matter of wealth, and it's not a matter of using the wealth in any way, but it's a matter of using the wealth in the proper manner. It's a matter of using the knowledge in the proper manner. And this is what we should be uh, wishing to emulate. This is what we should admire. But there's another point, by the way, that we can notice here. And that is that this has it, not only is it not with respect to worldly things that you cannot control and do anything about, but think about this hadith. Every human being, or I should say maybe virtually every human being, has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some level of wealth and some level of knowledge. SubhanAllah, think about this hadith. There is no hasad except for these two categories of people. And then the Prophet ﷺ described two categories of people for which everyone actually can emulate them. The Prophet ﷺ has defined two aspects, knowledge and wealth. And in reality, everyone has been given some level of knowledge and wealth. That means, in reality, everyone can emulate and everyone can imitate those people concerning whom they have this hasad for. And in other words, everyone can be like them. Maybe if someone has the latest, uh, you know, the most expensive car, the nicest, biggest house, you can never be like them. But you can be like the person whom Allah has given wealth and Allah has given knowledge and he's using the wealth in the proper way and he's using the, the knowledge in the proper way. You can be like them. So you should have this feeling. The Prophet ﷺ said there's only hasan in two cases. And he defined those two cases. And in both of those cases, they are actually within your means to be like the person for whom you have hasid. So this is not a self-defeating hasid. This is not a kind of hasid that is going to lead to misery on the part of the one who has this hasid. But instead, this can be something to encourage the person who has it, to drive him to do what the other person he's, uh, he's admiring is doing, and so therefore become just like the other person. So la has la hasid illa fi thnatain. There's no hasid except with respect to these two. The end result of this hadith, what it would mean, is that in your heart you should have a feeling to be like those people, and then when you have this in your heart, you will realize that you can be like those people because no matter how much wealth you have, no matter how much knowledge you have, you are going to be able to use it properly you are going to be able to benefit from those bounties in the same way that these two people or these two categories of people for whom you have us. Because in that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ did not say the man whom Allah has given lots of knowledge. Allah has given him wealth. So it says, wealth here is indefinite. It can be a small amount of wealth, it can be a large amount of wealth. There's nothing in this hadith that says you should be envious of the one whom Allah has given lots of wealth and he's using that wealth in the proper way. Nothing at all. And in the other case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him hikmah. Hikmah. Doesn't say lots of hikmah, doesn't say lots of wisdom, lots of knowledge, just hikmah. Again, indefinite term can mean lot, can mean little. So, you start out with this hadith, you should not be envious 
or have any, a hasad towards anyone except these two. And then when you think about it, you realize that, wait a minute, what it's saying is that I should admire and I should try to emulate these two, and in fact I can. There's nothing keeping me from being like these two. Because Allah has given me wealth, even if it's a little bit of wealth, I can make sure to use this wealth for what is truth, what is correct, what is right. And right includes, for example, sustaining myself and spending on myself and my family, that is part of uh, spending fil haq. And Allah has given me knowledge. Even if it's a small amount of knowledge, whatever, Allah has given me hikmah. And I just have to make sure that I use it properly, I, I make judgments based on that knowledge, and I try to teach that knowledge to others. If I have a little bit of knowledge, there's people maybe who have less knowledge than I do. There's maybe children who don't have the knowledge that I have. My own children maybe. I can pass that knowledge on to them. So in this hadith of the Prophet it is a very uh, special hadith, you could say. I think a lot of people have missed the point of this hadith of the Prophet by number one, not identifying with his hasad and, and not really giving that emotion of trying to be like or seeing that other people are doing something and, and having the admiration and, and the willingness to emulate them and then realizing that in reality in these two cases for which the Prophet ﷺ has allowed the Sasset everyone is able to if inshallah wills, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, if they will everyone is able to actually emulate the person for whom they have hasan in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ. So in this hadith, alhamdulillah, we know who it is that we should look towards and try to emulate. And incidentally also, if we cannot emulate them or if we feel that we are short in emulating them, this idea of hasan towards them, this idea of emulation also includes the idea of admiration. We shouldn't forget that point either that there is an aspect of admiration as well. The root of the hasad is there's something that you like, something that you want, right? So also here there is a kind of admiration. So you see the person having wealth, Allah has given him some level of wealth and he's using it properly. Allah is giving someone else knowledge and he's using it properly. So not only should you want to be like them, but there's a feeling in your heart of admiration for them. And this is very important. Because admiration is a kind of love. And if it is the case, for example, that you happen to find someone whom Allah has given lots of, of wealth and he's using it properly, or Allah has given lots of knowledge and he's using it properly, and so forth, someone who you cannot, who you feel like you cannot actually compete with, but if you have this admiration for them and this love for them, that will actually, in the, in the end, benefit you quite a bit. Just think of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ, a Bedouin, came, a Bedouin asked the Prophet ﷺ, what about a person who he sees another person, he, he, he recognizes this other person and he recognizes the qualities in him, so he loves that other person, but he himself cannot be like that other person. He himself cannot be like that other person or those other people. Okay, so someone sees some people and he likes them, but he is not of those people. The, the exactly what the, the Bedouin said, Araita Rajalan Ahabba Qoman Walamma Yalhaqbihim that the the person and he and he loves them but he cannot match them, he cannot actually be with them and in, in, you know with respect to the way they are and so forth. And the Prophet وسلم, gave a very important answer to him that inshallah can give us all hope and this goes back again once again to the importance of the acts of worship of the heart because the Prophet ﷺ said Huwa ma'aman ahab He is with the one whom he loves He is with the one he would be in other words he would be with the one whom he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he truly loves them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring them together. Another hadith, the Prophet, the Prophet sallam, told someone that the man said that he has not prepared much for the day of judgment 
except he loves Allah and the Messenger. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be with the one whom you love. So if you have this hasid, this proper hasid in your heart, that will develop in your heart an admiration for those who are doing good. That admiration grows into a real love for them. And inshallah, that means even if you have some shortcomings with respect to their deeds, inshallah, that means that you will uh, be with them, inshallah, on the day of judgment, you will be with them, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that love for them. Actually, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz once said, if you can, if you can be from the scholars or the students, then do so. If you cannot be from among them, then at least love them. And if you cannot do that, then at least do not hate them. And then he said, how perfect is Allah, Allah, Allah has made a way out uh, for everything. So, if you cannot actually be from the scholars or the students of knowledge, then at least you should have love for them. At least you should have love for them. And inshallah, that will benefit, for, that will benefit you. So the love for them will benefit you. And then he said that if you cannot love them, at least don't hate them. Because if you cannot benefit from your love for them, at least do not commit a sin by hating these people who are working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who are learning for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are passing on this deen. Unfortunately, some people have gotten to that point that they hate the ulama. This is obviously a great sign of, of a disease in their heart. So here we see that this kind of hasid that the Prophet ﷺ has described is very different from the prohibited hasid. Instead of a hasid which does not bring about any positive results, this is a kind of hasid that will bring about positive results. At the very least, if it doesn't change you to realize that you can be doing what they, they, what they can be doing, inshallah, it will lead to love for those people wishing to be like them, and therefore, inshallah, based on this love and based on this wish to be like them, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you to their level in the hereafter. Notice, by the way, the Prophet ﷺ did not mention jihad in this hadith. He did not mention that you can have hasid for the one who goes out and makes jihad and, and gives up his life and wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So obviously, many people have asked the question, why, we know how important jihad is in, is in, is in Islam, so why hasn't the Prophet ﷺ mentioned jihad in this hadith, to have hasid for those people who make jihad? Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has given a response to this question, and he says that the reason that, that jihad is not mentioned, he said that is because in general people do not have envy for someone who is exhausting himself even if he's doing a most virtuous deed. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ also did not mention the one who is praying and fasting and making hajj. Now obviously with all due respect to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, this response does not seem to be satisfactory. Because in reality, many people have hasid, or many people wish they could be like those people who make jihad. Right? Many people wish they could be they, they could be a martyr, wish that they could become martyr, and so therefore, when they see others going out and making jihad, they wish they could be like those people. So it's not the case that people don't wish to be like like the martyrs and so forth. But maybe what the hadith of the Prophet this hadith has implied is that when people are given wealth and when people are given knowledge and especially when people are given knowledge and they are acting on the basis of no that knowledge they are judging on the basis of that knowledge that means they are judging themselves on the basis of that knowledge and they are teaching others and setting the example for others so actually this what the Prophet has described with respect to wealth and knowledge this covers all of the all of the we can say all of the acts of worship, all the physical acts of worship. Because if he has that knowledge, if he's judging by that knowledge, first and foremost he's going to judge himself by that knowledge. So it means that he's applying that knowledge. And applying that knowledge means he's going to be praying, he's going to be fasting, he's going to be making jihad when necessary and so forth. So therefore, 
uh, if it's actually inclusive. Because think of someone, if you think of someone who has knowledge, you don't think of someone who has knowledge and he's judging by it and he's teaching it. This is someone who's not praying and not fasting. He has that knowledge, but he's not applying it. Obviously, this is not the kind of person the Prophet is referring to. So there was no need to mention jihad or fasting or praying and so forth because this all comes under the aspect of taking that knowledge and judging that knowledge properly. Wallahu a'lam. So that is the obligatory hasid, or at least if you don't know, if you don't want to go so far as to call it obligatory, at least we know this is the proper hasid, or this is the hasid that the Prophet has approved of. And this brings us to our next concept. With this feeling of, of admiration and the desire to emulate, brings us to also another concept in Islam, which is also something that should be characteristic of the true believers. And this is what is known as a tenathis. And this is where the believers compete with one another in acts of righteousness and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not an aspect of hasid whatsoever. Okay, at least this is not an aspect of the evil hasid whatsoever, at least I should say. This is not a disease in the heart. But this is the willingness or the desire in a person's, in a person's uh, heart to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to go beyond how others are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the drive behind this is actually a desire to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more than others are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to be satisfied with the fact that you know that others are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than you are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the drive behind this, the motivating factor is not that you are unhappy about what others are doing. But it is completely and solely related to you and your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability. And so if you are seeing others doing more than you, that makes you feel like therefore you can do more. If another human being who is similar to you is doing more than you, this might be, this should be assigned to you or could be assigned to you, of course given other factors, but this could be assigned to you, that you are not doing the most that you can do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you want to compete, and again, this is a this is not like capitalism. <laughs> this is a beneficial competition. Okay. You want to compete with them, so that you will know, inshallah, or you'll do your best to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and the best that you possibly can. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, for example, in uh, Surah Al Mutaffifin, وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون. Uh, talking about the rewards and Jannah and so forth and for this let those who want to strive compete Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says سَبِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَبْدُهَا كَعَبْدِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ عِدَّتْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ذَلِكَ فَضْرُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُلْ فَضْرِ الْعَدِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says race with one, race one with another and hastening towards forgiveness from your Lord and towards paradise. The width whereof is as the width of heaven and earth prepared for those who believe in Allah and His Messenger. That is the grace of Allah which He bestows on whom He pleases and Allah is the owner of great bounty. Uh, Ibn Rajab no noted that when this verse was revealed the Sahaba understood from that that they should strive to be the first to perform the noble deeds. And so therefore they found that they were lagging behind others or others did noble deeds before them. This saddened them. This saddened them because they knew that other people were doing good deeds before them. This saddened them because they knew that they did not take the initiative and try to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before other people try to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is when the heart is really attuned to Iman and to being completely healthy. They are saddened by that fact. And then Ibn Rajab noted that after some time people came and the matters were reversed and people started competing for the things of this world instead. So now what he's saying were 
people came later after the time of the Sahab and so forth and instead of competing trying to do those things that were pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tried to do them before anybody else now they're more worried about you know getting the best of this world getting the, the latest and the fastest computer before anybody else getting this before any, anybody else and so forth and it even happens by the way with respect to know some people they have to get the, a certain book the book that comes out they have to get it before anybody else they have to get the tape before anybody else the CD before anybody else and they may never read the book or even look at the book but they have to get it before anybody else so this kind of competition as, a, as opposed to com competing to do the deeds that are more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this situation has changed and in fact one of the one of the solutions you can say one of the solutions for this disease of competing in this world and always trying to compete in this world you may never you this is something you're going to lose for sure sometime there's no question about it but if you compete for the hereafter and that is really your intention and your intention is pure then because of that intention even if you fall short in deeds because of that intention actually you will be at the top uh, level no one can defeat you actually that's why Hassan al-Basri said that if you see someone competing with you for this world then compete with him for the hereafter don't worry about competing for this world but turn your attention to competing with others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now obviously there are some important points that we have to keep in mind with respect to this kind of competition as we said it is a healthy competition and the first key point with respect to this type of competition of racing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that one never never has the feeling in his heart that he wants the goodness for himself and excels others while others do not get it you know this is not part of the competition at all you are happy for your brothers actually when when you compete and they do well you are happy for them because this is actually part of your mind you are saddened that you cannot please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better than them but you have a feeling of happiness in their in their in your heart that someone did the act for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your brother or sister in Islam was able to do it okay, so there is never a feeling of resentment towards anyone who did the deed is never a feeling of resentment that the deed was done but it wasn't done at your hand this is absolutely and positively absent in this kind of, of positive com competition because the goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased whether you do the act or if somebody else beats you to it and does it for, for example if it's, a, if, it's an, if it's an act that only one person can do so you are not saddened by the fact that somebody else has done the act but you only wish that you could have done better with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to do with respect to what others are doing and earning but you wish you could have done better with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this kind of, of healthy competition you never at any time hope to remove what the others have received nor are you ever unhappy at what the others have received and the second key aspect to this type of, of competition and this is a very obvious aspect is that this competition is with, with respect to the hereafter and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for the matters of this world a competition with respect to the matters of this world is obviously blameworthy there's no benefit to it to try to compete against others and be having the best of this dunya over what others uh, over what others have this will not bring about any positive result and this actually can lead to the kind of hasid the evil hasid that we've been discussing that sooner or later somebody is going to get something better and beyond what you've gotten and so therefore you will have this feeling of hate and resentment and wishing to remove that bounty that the others have received so this is the concept of at atanas and we want to move on now to the concept of al-ithar 
Al-Ithar. And this Al-Ithar, when you begin to understand Al-Ithar, which is the concept of sacrificing for the sake of one's brother in Islam or one's sister, when you begin to understand this concept, you can really understand how distant Hasid is from Islam, the, the, the negative or the disease of Hasid. Because you can think of al ithar as virtually the exact opposite of Al-Hasid. In Al-Hasid you are upset when others get something, while in Ithar you are happy to give to others. Even if you have to sacrifice for the sake of your, of your brother or sister. And this is when, this is when Iman really enters the person's heart. When the Iman is truly in the person's heart, and the person is now concentrating on trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and is concentrating on the hereafter, not on this dunya, and sees his brothers and sisters, and in fact even all of humanity, but sees his brothers and sisters and all of humanity, not as a source of competition and hatred that that someone w that you will dislike because they have more than you, but sees them as a actually as a means of furthering one's closeness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Instead of being upset about what other people possess and what bounties Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given to others, you should look towards others as a means of getting closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by behaving towards them in the proper way you can please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so instead of wishing that they didn't have the bounties that they have you say you should instead wish that they get more bounties and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them in their bounties and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them and Allah guides them to use their bounties properly and when you have that feeling you will be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of trying to remove bounties from your brothers and your sisters, you actually you want to give them more bounties. You want them even to be happier because you love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of this you will once again come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can see from this how al hasan as we described in the hadith of Prophet al and hasan and Iman cannot combine together in one heart. Because really this is what Iman is all about looking towards others and behaving towards others in a way that will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this is not how you recognize the people around you and the people you interact with, that they are actually people whom you should deal with in a way that will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as opposed to dealing with them in such a way that will take you further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you do not understand what, uh, what iman or what, or what the iman should be in your heart. And of course, the real aspect of ithar is to sacrifice for the sake of your brother and sister. And what we mean by sacrificing for the sake of, the, of your brother and sister is captured in that word sacrifice. I mean, I'm using that word sacrifice for a specific reason. And that is that you are giving up something that you need. Okay, an ithar is not simply that you are giving wealth. You might have a billion dollars and you give ten dollars to someone in the mosque or you give ten dollars to the mosque. Okay, this is not al ithar This is inshallah sadaqah and this is good and, and there's nothing wrong obviously with, with doing that deed. You should do that deed. But when we speak about al ithar we are talking about sacrificing while you are in need of something. And here we see again how far Iman is from Hasid and this, and this, uh, now al ithar of course this is a goal of the believer. This is how believers should become. And we have many examples of this is how the believers did become. We have example in the Prophet Muhammad we have example in Mansur. In one uh, verse in the Quran, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّوُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِّمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خُصَاصًا وَمَنْ يُوْقَ الشُّحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
and those who before them had homes, talking about in Medina, and had adopted the faith. They love those who emigrate to them, and they have no jealousy, no envy in their hearts for that which they have been given. And this is in, re in particular reference to some booty that was given to the Mahajirin. And they give them, they give the others preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. And whoever is saved from his own greed, such are they who will be the successful. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They give preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. And actually, most of you are probably familiar with the a story that was that was related to this, where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, someone was in need of food, and the Prophet ﷺ actually at, his, at that time him and his family had no food to give him. So the Prophet ﷺ asked who would take this man to be his guest, and one of the Ansar one of the Muslims of Medina said that he would do so and when he took when he took him home he found that actually the, the, him and his family did not have any food except for the food that they were going to eat for themselves and their children so what they did is they put their children to sleep they, they put out their lamp and made it look like they were eating and they gave the food to this guest and they went to bed without any food so therefore, when they, when they, uh, in the next morning, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laughed at or was pleased with what you did, uh, in the preceding night. But actually we find many, this is just one example, but there were many examples during the time of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in which the Muslims sacrificed for others, sacrificed for their brothers and sisters so that their, their brothers and sisters could have what they need, even though they themselves were in need. As I said, this is a characteristic of a man, this is a characteristic that should permeate the Muslim society, the society of the believers. Instead of being a society of hasid, where, where different members of the society are angry or upset that other people have bounties, Instead of being a, a dog eat dog kind of capitalistic society where everyone is competing against each other and just wants to wipe out and do better than the others, now this is not what the Islamic society should be like. This is not what Muslims should be. Muslims should have a real love for one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they have that real love for one another, they will love for each other what they love for themselves instead of al hasid and not only that, they will seek to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way that they can, and this means doing the good deeds before others can, can do it, so that they can please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this also means sacrificing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving to others even when they are in need. This is the true nature of the one who has real iman in itself. And we find this example among the Sahaba, we find it among those people who have this true Iman in their hearts. And this is al ithar Now al ithar I'll just make, since we are out of time, I'll just make one final point about al ithar which is an important point that has come up sometimes recently. And that is that al ithar does not mean that one gives up fulfilling his obligations towards others in the name of sacrificing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, I as an individual, if I don't want to, if, I, if I'm willing to give up food for tonight and for tomorrow night and for a week so that others can eat, that's, that's my prerogative. So I'm doing that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, I'm doing a good thing. But if I have others who are dependent on me and it's my obligation to fulfill their needs, such as a wife, such as children, and so forth, I cannot force them or I cannot neglect their needs in order to supposedly sacrifice and give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if they give or they're willing to, to also do the same and join with me in this act, that's one thing. But they do have this obligation upon me. 
and I have to fulfill that obligation upon me, especially if they, if they, if I can see, you know, sometimes, you know, someone may not, you don't want to force someone to come out openly and say, for example, I don't want you to be making da'wah because I want you to fulfill my needs here, I need to eat, I need food, I need, the children need food and so forth, you don't want to force them to say that, but you can see actually that they are in need of food and so forth, and so you do not leave them without food, without being provided for in the name of al-ikar or sacrificing for others. Yes, you can do it for yourself, but if you have obligation towards others, you have to meet those obligations. And if, and only if they want to give up also, then, of course, then you have the right, uh, or you can together do this act of al for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll have to wrap up, inshallah, on this, on this point. We have gone now from stressing the emotions in the heart and realizing that they are acts of worship in the heart. There are definite acts of worship in the heart that are obligatory upon us, and at the same time there are diseases can, that can affect the heart, and we have to be very careful about these diseases, and one of the greatest of them is al-hasad. And al-hasad in general, like so many things in the physical body, there are things that are needed to some extent, but once it gets out of hand, it causes harm, and only causes harm. And unfortunately for most people, the only experience of, of hasid, and the only thing they know about hasid is the evil hasid in which they desire uh, what other people have, or they desire even to destroy what other people have, or the desire to destroy other people in the process. And this is a very evil disease. All of us must be aware of it, and all of us must work to remove it from ours. But the feeling and the emotion that should be in the heart and should be alive in the heart is wanting to do what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore when we see others who are doing what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should have this feeling of wanting to be like them and wanting to emulate them. And if this feeling is strong in the heart, it is a positive feeling. And it is called actually by the Prophet Hassan. But it is a positive feeling and it will drive us also to do good. So we should not go to the extreme of having this evil husband in our heart, nor should we go to the extreme of not having any feeling of being like those people who are doing the deeds that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of those extremes we have to avoid so that inshallah our heart will be sound, it will be healthy, and when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with us and He will enter us into His Jannah. By the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bahamdik wa shadwan la ilaha illa amt wa stalfiruka wa tuwilik.